<sighs> well, grand rising, everyone. Grand rising. rising, yes. That's our greeting all year. And happy Mother's Day. I was noticing that um, Mother Earth certainly was putting on a show. Have you seen the Northern Lights? Did anyone see them Friday night? No, I did, I, uh, there was a little overcast down here, but I understood if you went high up, you could see them. I, um, I, I did go out last night to see, because there was rumors that, that Mother Nature would have put on a second show, but um, apparently I couldn't stay up late enough for it, so. Because <laughs> it was a school night. <laughs> So I, I want to recognize the mothers in the room. Um, if you are a mother, would you please stand and so we can appreciate you? Thank you. Thank you so much. I think motherhood is a special kind of service to the world, for sure, most definitely. And, um, and I would say that Mother's Day while it is a, a lovely holiday, it is a, it's a little complex sometimes because not everybody had a good experience with motherhood. And not everybody chose to be a mother. Not everybody was able to be a mother. I have some very powerful women in my life who are not mothers for one reason or another. And, and some of these women choose not to come to church on Sunday because it's a little uncomfortable for them. It's, it's a little, you know, one particular friend tried really hard to get pregnant and was never able to have children. And so while I know we celebrate our mothers, I also want to honor those that are um, nurturers and give life to the world in different ways. And I have this... Um, this wonderful reading that I want to share with you. And this is for the uh, people in the room who uh, were not able to have children for one reason or another, whether by choice or because they couldn't. Some of you are not mothers by choice. You personally have determined the wisest course for you. Maybe the reasons are medical. Or maybe... They have to do with the demands of your personal mission. Whether that's a career to which you are called forth to or a form of ministry that would have been hard for you to have a family. Some of you are not mothers simply because your life took a certain path that did not include motherhood. You have done what seemed right, made the decisions that were consistent with who you are and what you love. Maybe you were never married or never arrived at a situation that you considered healthy for nurturing children. Maybe life, a major life events removed you from the motherhood track. Some of you are not mothers because of severe wounding in your life or in the life of your family. That damage could be abuse, depression, addiction, or other illness of one kind or another a condition of one's soul that has required most of your time and energy for the sake of healing and restoration. All of this got in the way of life that includes partnership and childbearing. And some of you are not mothers despite every effort you made to become one. You tried for months or years to become pregnant or to finalize an adoption, but those plans were thwarted through no fault of your own, the only people who could possibly understand how hard that was for you are those who have experienced that situation themselves. Whatever your reason for being childless, please know this, you are indeed a source of life to the world. You possess the ability to nurture others, and if you free yourself to do so, you will be amazed how fertile you really are. And that's by Vanita Hampton Wright. And so we honor all those that are mothers and all those that were not, were not mothers for one reason or another. Life 
always gives us an opportunity to be creative. And we're not all creative in the same ways. Our um, topic today is living a value-led life. And for me, one of my very high values is inclusion and belonging. So, of course, I want to recognize both the mothers in the room and those that are not mothers. I want to honor whether, whether motherhood is something that is easy for you to hold and celebrate or whether it's something that might be challenging, difficult, or just a choice you didn't make. I want to honor all those different places that we come from because if we're going to create a world that works for everyone, if we're going to hold this high vision, then that value of inclusion and belonging is powerful. And if I'm going to live a uh, value-led life, then I need to find ways to scoop you all up, to include you all with whatever we're doing. What I, what I know for myself is that um, living a value-based and a value-led life can sometimes be a little challenging. Sometimes I get sidetracked from my values. Sometimes life gets pretty busy and I find myself, um, oh, I don't know, working on that to-do list in a process somewhere and the values are somewhere in my hip pocket and I'm not paying attention. And so as we look at this idea of how to live a, a value-led life, I think there are a couple of of perspectives, a couple of tools that we need in order to do that. One of them is mindfulness and paying attention. We need to be mindful of what our values are. We need to keep them in front of us. Michael Beckwith says this, as the alchemist of your own life, find a bit of the frequency you want to experience, and when he says frequency, he's talking about values, and place your attention there as it becomes your perception, live from there. So Michael Beckwith is only reminding us that it is the mindfulness around our values and keeping them in front of us that really gives us the opportunity to create, uh, if you will, a lens that we look at life through. The things that help me to live my life for my values, the things that help keep me centered are things like spiritual practice, meditation, being in spiritual community, uh, taking classes, all of those things help me to be mindful and to keep my perspective clear. One of the things that um, I enjoyed most about uh, this particular philosophy, as I began to study it and as I began to um, see that there, were, uh, there was this way of life and this philosophy that seemed so rich, was that the people who were really practicing this philosophy had a deep sense of clarity. I'm hoping that the reason we just had a little upset in the back there is because someone's here to, for youth church. So <laughs> um, that would be wonderful. We had a little, little hiccup with scheduling this morning. <sighs> See, there's me with my belonging and inclusion again. <laughs> yeah, so, so back to this idea of, of values. It is the spiritual tools that we teach and we practice and we learn from each other and we continue to lean into that give us this deeper sense of clarity. And when we have clarity, we can, we can see our values, we can, we can pay attention to them, we can choose to uh, uh, our behavior and our actions and the way we are in the world and have those all be value-based, based on the values that we hold for ourselves. One of my other core values is integrity. And of course, there's a couple of wonderful, um, uh, I'll call them masters in the world, one of them being Brene Brown. And this is what she has to say about integrity. Integrity is choosing courage over comfort. I'm going to say that again. Integrity is choosing courage over comfort. 
It's choosing what's right over what is fun or easy. It's choosing to practice your values rather than simply professing them. Mm. Right? We have to walk the walk. We, can't, we have to walk the talk. We can't just espouse pretty words. It is about how we behave. And, and, and honestly, how I am in the world and how you are in the world says, talks about what we value. And so certainly we want to be the clearest expression of those values in our relationships, in the way we treat each other, in the way we talk, in the way we behave. It's all very important. And having courage, whew, boy, sometimes it's not easy to lead with courage, right? Sometimes it's, it's there's some low-hanging fruit, like, you know, wanting to make it all better or fix it or try to appease things as opposed to having the courage to lead from your values. And I have found that when I don't have courage, when I deviate from my values... Well, life gets a little messy. My relationships aren't as clear. You know, there's, I'm, I'm, I'm not feeling... You know, I've gotten used to, because I have these, these core values that are important to me, I've gotten used to how it feels to live from those values. And I think a lot of you know what I'm talking about. And so when I'm, when I'm off the beam, I can feel it, and, I, and know that there's time, it's time to make a course correction. And living from our values requires that, that, that mindfulness and that attention so that we can make those little course corrections as we need to. The other tool that helps us with our values is passion. Knowing what we really care about, recognizing the things that we really have a passion for and are, are inspired by, guides us towards the experiences that are truly meaningful and joyful and helps us to navigate this world with a sense of purpose. And so passion can be one of the guiding um, mechanisms that we use to really know where our passions lie. And, And sometimes, you know, it requires a little time to think about it, right? If you're just... If you're just running on empty, going full speed ahead through life, you're not taking the time to do self-reflection or to consider what the things are that that you value. If you don't put them in front of you, it's hard to live a um, value-driven life. And the final point about living a value-led life is that it's important for us to contemplate What is underneath those values? What are the beliefs and the thoughts that encourage you to have these values, to care about these things, to have passion for the things that you value in life? And so I I will tell you that my top two values are belonging and integrity. Those are two of the top. Sometimes it's hard to choose, right? But, But those are high up there for me. And when I did the work of examining my motivation or what was underneath my value of belonging, I noticed that as a kid, as a youngster who moved around a lot, that I, I really didn't feel like I belonged anywhere, right? I was in a new neighborhood every two or three years, starting over, starting to make new friends. And so belonging was very important to me. And the other thing that happened was when I was a kid, when I was younger, there was almost nothing I wouldn't do to belong. And as I matured and I noticed that that value for belonging was out of sync with that value with integrity. I had to find a way to be con- congruent with both. It was very informative to do that kind of self-reflection and to pay attention to that. And it, and it helped shape who I am today because I paid attention and because I looked at what I was passionate about and because I was willing to look at this idea of living a value-led life. 
The other thing that I want to share about choosing to live a value-led life is that this is for us. The values that I hold, that I live by, that I choose to uh, help inform my, um, my uh, behavior and my words and the way I, my relationships, these are my values. And so they're for me. They're not for me to impose on someone else. Right? I think sometimes we can get a little mixed up around that. Sometimes we think that because we value something, well, then everybody has to value it. It is the value that must be, you know, we must, you know, march out into the world with. But living a valued-led life is not about conformity, if you will. It's really about informing us and helping us to know what it is that we are... Um, it's the North Star and the compass for us, right? When we understand our values, we use it to know what direction to move into with both our acts, our deeds, our words, our thoughts, our behavior. And by harnessing the power of attention and passion and belief, we can begin to take those steps towards a value-led life. And the three things I want you to take away with you today are that cultivating mindfulness and directing your attention towards understanding your core values is key, that this gives us the guidance to shift our thoughts and our beliefs and our actions in ways that align us with our values, and that exploring our passions guides us in understanding our values. From the, uh, a quote from the person who came up with this month's topic, they write, aligning our thoughts, words, and actions with these beliefs guides us towards living a life of integrity and authenticity. This alignment creates an inevitable movement from good to great, to grand, as we recognize and activate our values in both our individual and collective experiences. So wise, so wise to help remind us that it's important for us to look at our beliefs and to look at our passion and to use our, that power of mindfulness, those three tools, so that we can indeed uh, walk the talk and live a vision-led life. I'm going to end with a quote from Howard Thurman. And some of you may be familiar with it. It's very powerful. It's from his book, The Inward Journey. And Howard Thurman was a great civil rights activist uh, and was um, one of the influencers of Martin Luther King. And he writes... Keep fresh before me the moments of my high resolve. Despite the dullness and barrenness of the days that pass, if I search with due diligence, I can always find a deposit left by some former radiance. But I had forgotten. At the time, it was fully orbed, glorious, and resplendent. I was sure that I would never forget in the moment of its fullness, I was sure that I would illuminate my path for the, all the rest of my journey. I had forgotten how easy it is to forget. There was no intent to betray what seemed so sure at the time. My response was whole, clean, authentic, but little by little there crept into my life the dust and grit of the journey. Details, lower-level demands, all kinds of cross-currents, nothing momentous, nothing overwhelming, nothing flagrant, just wear and tear. If there had been some direct challenge, a clear-cut issue, I would have fought it to the end and beyond. In the quietness of this place, surrounded by the all-pervading presence of God, my heart whispers, Keep fresh before me the moments of my high resolve that in fair weather or in foul, 
in good times or in tempest, in the days when the darkness and the foe are nameless or familiar, I may not forget that to which my life is committed. Keep fresh before me my moments of my high resolve. Thank you very much. So let's pray. That thing we do to keep before us our high resolve, our high resolve to live by principle, to live from a place of value. And so I simply invite you to go within with me, lower your gaze or close your eyes, and to bring your awareness up to that place within you that has never forgotten your deep connection with the divine. That there is this beloved, all-powerful, all-pervading energy, this presence, this, this divine pattern in life that is always expressing itself by means of us. And so I know as, as we sit here today, as you join me in this prayer, you recognize those same attributes in yourself, that you too are divine wisdom and form, that you too are indeed that presence of the divine in the form and in the individuated expression of the self. And so I know as we walk through this week, as we continue to explore how it is that we move from good to great to grand, that we keep before us the values, the things that we hold dear, the core ideas that we choose to live by. And what I know for each one is that it is grace-filled, that even when we miss the mark, even when we fall short, we simply course correct and continue to move forward in the direction of our passion and our attention and our beliefs. I'm so grateful for the resolve of each one who has chosen to live a life towards greater mastery of principle and personally held values. I know that there is indeed a movement of humankind towards a world that works for all as we are mindful, as we are self-reflective, and as we pour all the wonderful fruits of that labor out into the world by means of each one. And so I give thanks for this. I know that we are blessed by this. We simply let it go. We surrender it from whence it came. And together we say, and so it is.